This is the leveraging healthcare organizations, uh, economic resources to advance racial equity at the community level. So this is the breakout session. I hope you're in the right session. Um, and then uh, we have a, again, rock star panel today, uh, and I'll introduce them in a little bit more detail um, when we get started. Uh, but Patrice Allen Brady, Mike Jones, Wiley Liu, and Doug Parrish, and then I'll be your moderator today, Megan Sandel. Um, I'm just gonna briefly walk through, again, kind of our agreements of a safe and brave space. Um, uh, we obviously want to practice active, judgment-free, empathetic listening, respect each other's differences and backgrounds, agree to disagree, but seek understanding, uh, honor um, uh, some, of our, uh, some of our practices here, be curious, um, uh, welcome being called in as an invitation to learn, be mindful of position and power dynamics, be inclusive, uh, uh, try to release control and privilege and accept things maybe unresolved. Um, and so I'm really gonna um, ask each of you to, to hold these principles while we're doing this panel today. And then lastly, we wanna invite a lot of different ways to engage. So the chat window is a great window and I encourage you to, can, to use it while our speakers are speaking. Um, uh, I'm gonna try to manage the panel such that we are speaking for about uh, 30 minutes and then hopefully have a good 20 minutes for questions and discussion. But obviously if there are chats, I will be monitoring it while they're speaking and, and hopefully um, uh, interact. Definitely love the emoji reactions. Um, and as you're getting closer, um, I'll warn you when we're gonna be opening up for questions um, more broadly and definitely raising your hand is a great way to be able to, to manage um, people. Um, and then obviously, if people could be mindful of the mute function, just so that um, uh, there aren't uh, a lot of background noise. So with that, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, I'm gonna be really excited to, to get started today. Um, and so one of the things that I just wanted to, to lift up just for a few minutes is like the goal of this session today is really to start to think differently about healthcare organizations and how we can contribute to racial equity work actually through our operational side of healthcare, right? I think that a lot of the sessions around um, advancing racial equity and social care have focused on patient level interact interactions and patient level interventions. And that's good. And we should obviously do that. And I'm going to ask us to think about how do we operate as health systems, what's our operational economies, and how do we start to do what we would call healthcare anchor work with a focus on racial equity so that we can not just help patients honestly be healthier with patient level interventions, but can we also invest in the communities where patients live as a way to uh, create healthier communities? And so how do you do that authentically, it's not doing that to community, it's doing it with community, and specifically focusing on communities that have been historically underserved and disinvested in through things like practices like structural racism and redlining. Mm -hmm. um, I think each of our speakers will speak to the promise and the challenges of the work and particularly focusing on racial equity. And we're gonna give a bunch of different dimensions of kind of place-based uh, procurement, place-based hiring, place-based investing. Um, from two amazing organizations, both UCSF and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, and I think that as we start to, to think about this more, this is unique opportunities for us as researchers to be able to document these impacts and be able to make them uh, meaningful. So um, with that, I'm gonna kick it over to our first speaker, um, which is Wiley Liu, who is the director of the Center for Community Engagement at UCSF and a leader of UCSF's anchor institution work. And what I want Wiley to do is to give kind of an overview of UCSF's anchor institution mission work, particularly with a focus on community engagement, community partnerships, and how you're working with partnerships to facilitate and guide the work, and just really talk about how are you using that as a tool towards advancing racial equity. So Wiley, take it away. Thank you so much, Megan, for that kind introduction. I also want to thank Siren for this very, very exciting session on racial health 
equity and social care is such a critically important topic for us, uh, not just at UCSF, but nationally. Um, I want to maybe start off by um, sharing with you the goal of our anchor institution mission, which is to collaborate with our community partners to increase the economic security and opportunity for under-resourced population in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we do that by leveraging UCSS workforce development, procurement, and community investment resources. So we actually embarked on this journey some six, seven years ago, and really was able to launch this work two, three years ago. And when we think about this work, I want to use the word economic inclusion, but more explicitly racial economic inclusion, because when we think about the disparities and equities, it is very much divided along those racial lines. Um, so when we started this work two, three years ago, when we officially launched, one of the first things we did is that we know this is very, very complicated work. We cannot do this by ourselves. So we knew it was important to bring community partners and stakeholders to the table. So um, as part of that process, we brought together a anchor institution steering committee to guide the overall UCSF work. And within that, we have three subcommittees. Uh, a workforce zone subcommittee, a procurement one, as well as a community investment one. And for each of those subcommittees, as well as a larger st steering committee, um, we invited people not just within UCSF with expertise, but external to UCSF, our community partners, our city partners, people who have expertise, people who have trust and relationships in communities that we're trying to impact and I'm just so thrilled Doug Parrish is here. So Doug actually co-chairs our procurement subcommittee. So for each of those committees and subcommittee, we have two co-chairs, one representing UCSF, one representing the community so that we have this shared power relationship. Um, having said that, um, we also, in addition to the, the high level group guiding this work, we have leaders, uh, staff people who are actually executing the day-to-day -day work. So super thrilled Mike Jones is here leading our workforce effort. And when we were trying to hire a team to lead this work, we were mindful of the fact that we need to have people who reflect the communities we're here to serve. So, so thrilled that our team members are the most diverse team member you will see at UCSF um, because people often remind us and me every day, are you walking your talk? You know, Every decision we make, we have to think about that. Um, so, so that is just a couple of examples of how we're doing it. And maybe to sort of um, bring it home, uh, Megan, what I will share with you is another, our community investment uh, example. So we basically are piloting $5 million in community investment. And it, we've decided to use an RFQ process to do that and in inviting financial intermediaries to apply. And one of the key criteria we have for that is that we want to measure them through a racial equity lens. So not only do we want these entities to uh, have ex expertise working in the communities we're interested in, 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 in impacting, but we also want to know things like, who are the management staff? Are they you know, diverse? Who are the boards of directors of these intermediaries? Are they diverse? Um, and maybe another point I want to make is um, the, the, the value of having these um, very diverse um, subcommittees and committees is that when people like Michael and I go to present to them our progress, our work, often the very first question we get is, okay, tell us the demographics of who you're impacting. You know, Is it their communities of interest? Because if it's not, um, we're often told it's not good enough. You guys have to try harder. So they truly keep us honest, they keep us accountable. It doesn't always feel good for people like Michael and me who work so hard, but it really motivates us to try a bit, a bit further, go a bit further, try a bit harder. So with that, Megan, I'm gonna stop there. Oh, that's awesome, Wiley. And I think in a lot of ways, I'm gonna quote um, one of my colleagues um, and close friends at Boston Medical Center, the leader of our anchor institution work is Dr. Thea James. And she talks a lot about, we need to move with intentionality. So, so everything you're talking about to advance racial equity, you have to constantly be checking your intentionality. So I'm just gonna lift that up. And then the other thing I'm gonna lift up from what you said is inclusion, right? And, and I think to, to include people is to understand how they were excluded 
from it to get go, right? What are the barriers? What are the walls that you're trying to tear down? And so some of that can be as simple as who's your network, right? How are you, you know, hearing about opportunities? How easy is it to apply for it? Are you, you know, setting aside certain opportunities? And so you have to be as intentional with inclusion because you're undoing the, the racist practices that have excluded people from wealth to get for. Um, all right, so let's invite uh, Doug to the conversation. Um, uh, Doug Parrish is the president and CEO of Red Dipper, which is a small minority owned electrical contractor in San Francisco. And as Wiley said, he co-chairs UCSF's Anchor Institution Mission Procurement Subcommittee. And so Doug, I hope you can share your experiences about how does UCSF's Anchor Institution work in that subcommittee? How did you get involved? How's it going? Like, you know, what would you say is going well? Where is there room for improvement? And how would you give to other healthcare organizations that are on the Zoom today, how they can engage with community members like you to advance their anchor work with this racial equity lens? Yes, uh, thank you for having me this morning. This is uh, such a blessing to uh, be a part of this uh, Zoom meeting today. It, it is definitely uh, needed. I think that uh, with Wiley's comments about the Anchor Institute, it's been a privilege to, to serve as, a, uh, as the co-chair of the uh, procurement committee, uh, simply because of the fact that I believe the Anchor Institute, in addition to UCSF, they have um, uh, a, a hypothesis that having jobs and contracts and being involved on UCSF's uh, procurement uh, gives small businesses, small diverse businesses, an opportunity to have a seat at the table. Uh, for example, there's a big, huge Parnassus contract that's coming out. It's a billion dollars. And if it wasn't for the Anchor Institute, a lot of the small diverse businesses in San Francisco that surrounds UCSF would not have a seat at the table and would not be able to participate on that contract. So me as a uh, advocate for small and diverse businesses, as my position with the Anchor Institute, in addition to being on the UC Advisory Committee for Small and Diverse Businesses, we are advocating for small businesses to participate on those contracts because there's a, um, there's a symb symbiotic relationship between having jobs and contracts and healthcare, right? So if you don't have jobs and contracts and you're sitting at your, at your home with your kids and you're like, oh, I don't have a, I don't have a job, I don't have contracts, they're not they're not providing a seat at the table that causes issues from a healthcare perspective. And it's as if UCSF and the Anchor Institute is looking far beyond, right? They're saying, well, let's, let's meet people where they are. Let's bring them to the table. Let's get them ramped up so that they can have an opportunity to participate on these contracts so that we can prevent the healthcare crisis from ballooning in the future. Right, so that's a big part of my advocacy work for UCSF, and I've really enjoyed the last couple of years of being a part of it. It's a great dynamic team, folks that really care about folks in the community. Uh, you know, reaching out to uh, different organizations such as the uh, African American Chamber of Commerce, the Asian Chamber of Commerce. I mean, there are different organizations that are advocating for their group and their constituents. Uh, throughout the city and county of San Francisco. And the Anchor Institute just lends that olive branch to say, hey, come on in. We want to hear from you. We want to know the barriers that you talk about. And those barriers can be, uh, we, we can get over those barriers if we know what those barriers are. A lot of times we are uh, advocating for, you know, a seat at the table, but we don't have the resources to to execute on those contracts, right? So the bonding, some of the, the granular things that go on to be a, a, a successful partner to a large organization like UCSF and other healthcare organizations, those barriers need to be addressed. And um, we believe that uh, through communication and having transparency that we can uh, meet the needs of the folks in the community to head off of those challenges that we foresee of having uh, healthcare issues in the future. 
Yeah, I just want to um, lift up a couple of things because this has been a journey in our anchor work in terms of things. So like you may say, oh, there's a billion dollar contract out there. Isn't that great? Can Red Dipper bid on that? And the issue is, is no, that's too big of a job. Like you need to, as an, as an anchor institution, bite size the jobs so that right. people can actually bid on them. And then the other thing can happen is like we've um, had issues where we are wanting to partner with organizations. And guess what? We are a big institution. We pay people on 180 day schedules. Mm. And if you're trying to pay your workers on a regular thing, you need a different payment schedule than That's what right. different things. And so how do you start to, to unpack those barriers that you don't even know are there to excluding people having to do it? And so I do think these are like, I joke a little bit, I've learned more about paying community partners in the last year than I ever thought I would learn, but they're really important if you're going to be intentional about moving uh, forward on that. Um, all right. Absolutely. So I'm oh, sorry, please go ahead, Doug. Yeah. No, I was just that. going to share that some of the challenges that are uh, at UCSF and probably at other organizations as well is that there are different departments within UCSF. I mean, huge departments, and they don't often communicate with each other. And now you have, you know, the Anchor Institute coming down saying, hey, you guys have to participate and have small business, you know, participation on your contracts. And they're like, who are these people, right? And so it's kind of like, you, you want them to just uh, change the way that they've been doing business for a number of years. And it's a little bit of a heavy lifting that goes on there. But as long as, like, for example, on that Parnassus billion dollar contract, as long as the general contractor who is overseeing the entire project has the same goals and vision as UCSF and the Anchor Institute, I think we'll be okay. The disconnect is when the general contractor that's been selected to have a goal to include X amount of percent for small diverse businesses has that disconnect. Oh, we're at 20%, but UCSF wants us to be at 30%. And it's just doesn't happen. No, it's totally right. And, and I do think it's um, uh, this idea of how do we say to our group purchasing organization, we are going to hold you accountable and be our partner on this procurement spend. I think, again, that's how we act through intentionality. All right, so I'm going to invite now to the conversation Michael Jones, and he is leading the anchor hiring work at uh, UCSF, and he can describe how the institution is moving with intentionality through workforce development and how, you know, th that can be opportunities, but also challenges relating to meeting those racial equity goals with jobs and opportunities in economic inclusion. So, Mike. Thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you, Siren, for this wonderful opportunity. I think it's it's always great when you have uh, everyone that's on this call in the same room. I think we're able to to learn and share with each other. One of the things that I, I want to go to the the net payment uh, timeline. So one of the things when you start to think about staffing, and you say, well, we want to pay on a net, you know, maybe ninety. Uh, that's that's unreasonable for a lot of small businesses. Net 30, net 15 is probably more ideal. And when you think about how that impacts their staff, and to Doug's point, uh, we may then end up seeing people letting folks go. And then that results in lack of health care, lack of additional resources to live a healthy life. And if that healthy life is impacted, uh, chances are their additional work opportunities may also become impacted. And so when we think about the anchor workforce strategies, we are truly looking at the long-term health outcomes. And in 2019, we did a San Francisco did a community needs health assessment. And what we found was that when you look at the Black African-American population uh, in particular within San Francisco, the average life expectancy for a male uh, identified individual in San Francisco was about 10 to 13 years less than most other entity, uh, most other groups uh, within the city. You know, when you think about that wide of a disparity, that is not something that you should be able to sleep well at night thinking about. And we could think about, well, how does workforce fit into all of this? This is a healthcare matter, right? This is access to healthcare. This is uh, preventative care uh, that we need to look at. However, when you start to really peel that back, for example, I didn't start getting some of my best healthcare until I got good jobs. 
And so when you start to think about that on a city uh, city level perspective, most individuals are, are probably not able to access that healthcare because of either not being able to have adequate work opportunities uh, or they didn't have adequate uh, educational or training opportunities to then move into those jobs that could provide that. And so what we really looked at is how do we help to mitigate and decrease that life expectancy gap by creating things like pathways, structured pathways that lead to more than just a job. It's really great to get you in the door, get you a paycheck and get you going down that path. But our goal will continue to be how do we then move you? And so we use a, 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 a term from one of our partner healthcare anchor network that says we want to move you from outside in and from inside up. And whatever that inside up looks like, it could be different for every single person. But what our core mission is, is to ensure that when you are set in foot within UCSF, that we're providing as many resources as possible to help you grow your skills and to become that much better at whatever it is that you're doing. And so in the last couple of years, we've uh, developed a few pathway programs. One in particular, uh, we developed for our incumbent staff. So these are individuals who were working and they still are working with UCSF for the last two years, maybe five years, some of them 15 years. And they were in particular roles that they didn't quite see how they could go back to school and get that new skill. And so we created a medical assistant training program, one of many programs that we now have. And what it really did was it said, from an employer perspective, let's take a step back and really look at what it takes to ensure that our team members are successful. That means flexible work schedules. That means training that occurs off hours on weekends so that individuals don't have to stop their lives, uh, stop their earning opportunities for, for them to continue. And so fast forward 10 months ago, we're now here at the point where in about two weeks to three weeks, individuals are going to be able to complete uh, an MA training program that was custom made by UCSF and our partners um, with medical assistance certification, an EKG certification, and a phlebotomy certification, all paid for and covered by UCSF. And I think if we want to continue driving health equity within our communities that have been disinvested, and of course, keeping in mind that within your own healthcare systems or within your own ent entities, your staff are oftentimes your first community. If that's how we approach it, we need to take a different look at how we structure workforce uh, in addition to saying, hey, here's an open position. We hope you take it. No, I think, Mike, that's such a good overview. And I feel like in a lot of ways, when we talk about um, addressing health-related social needs, whether they be food insecurity or housing instability, sometimes the way to do that is to help someone have a better paying job. And I know that's one of our, you know, kind of social questions that we ask is, do you want help with more education? Do, are you unemployed and need help with employment? And that's one of the most um, uh, regularly top three things that patients say, yes, I do want help with that. And so what's our role in, in setting that moving forward? All right, so I'm going to now invite our last panelist, which is, uh, 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 last but not least, uh, Patrice Allen Brady is the Senior Engagement Manager for Healthy Homes at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So we've heard a lot of great things about UCSF, but Nationwide Children's has also been a real national leader in healthcare anchor work. And so what I um, am wondering is, um, uh, I want you to first step back and tell us, Patrice, more about the Healthy Neighborhoods Healthy Families Project and all the different aspects of that work. And then we'll dive more into the place-based investing and the neighborhood work that you can describe in more detail. Sure. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm super excited to be with this group. It's ready to get a chance to talk to researchers. So this is really cool right now. So Nationwide Children's Hospital in 2008 started their Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families Initiative. And they started it near the hospital, right? So they started just in a geography near the hospital, which we call Columbus, the South Side, recognizing that the people and families that live near the hospital were in need of the services that the hospital was providing, but they were never accessing those services, right? And they also recognized that there were other um, social determinants of health that the community needed addressed that other organizations had not stepped up to help them with. So with the uh, launch of Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families, um, it focuses on education, um, community um, enrichment, um, health and wellness, and economic development, which is more of like a workforce development component. Um, now recently going into the match savings program type of component and affordable housing. And our affordable housing component is a partnership between Nationwide Children's Hospital and the community-based organization called Community Development for All People. And they're housed on the south side of Columbus. 
Awesome. Yeah, I want to lift up. I had the pleasure of actually touring um, in uh, Columbus in 2018. And when we talk about, I think many of our academic institutions do have pretty severely disinvested neighborhoods, sometimes right next to the hospital. And mm -hmm. so in 2008, I just want to lift up a couple of statistics out of the South Side. So it, um, uh, at that point, this was like, if you guys remember the, the Great Recession of mm -hmm. 2008, 2009, a quarter of the houses in the South Side were um, foreclosed and abandoned. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about an extreme amount of um, disinvestment so starkly there and really nationwide children's diving in with a place-based investing strategy where they purchased those abandoned homes, renovated them and then sold them to employees um, as a place-based investing strategy. So I just want to kind of highlight that as a racial equity lens because that neighborhood was disproportionately African-American. And so being able to create a wealth building strategy was a real intentionality that the hospital brought forward. Um, Patrice, could you describe a little bit more? Because I know it's more than just that affordable housing. Tell me about more of the place-based investing strategies that started on the, on the South Side. So with the affordable housing um, under that umbrella, we're talking like home ownership, which you just mentioned before. And it wasn't just hospital employees that were buying it. There were a lot of first time home buyers that typically would not have had the opportunity to buy a home stepping into that space. Um, a lot of our um, partnership came from the county, um, the city of Columbus, to help close that gap funding for folks that may not have been able to afford a $300,000 home. But with that gap funding closure, uh, where it's the development closure as well as the, um, the financing closure, they're able to step into home ownership at that time, probably around $125,000 um, as far as the loan goes for them, for their mortgage. Um, and then since then, what we noticed was that the neighborhood was transforming and the people who wanted to stay in the neighborhood, not everyone wanted to be a homeowner. And so we stepped into that rental space, right? And so we started developing some of the um, existing structures and rehabbing those, also partnering with the land bank to build new housing in the area that was um, lead free, asbestos free. So families that had a child with asthma or had any other kind of allergies will be able to safely live in these homes and thrive. Um, and then in addition to existing homeowners that lived in the area, we had a home repair program. So helping existing residents stay in the community that they love. Um, and the home repairs at that time were probably averaging around $10,000. Um, on the South side, we're averaging probably around 15 right now. And our contractors are very kind and give us very affordable pricing for those projects. <laughs> yeah, I've been like, just so you know, jonesing to do a home repair service in Boston since that visit. And I swear we're going to get it accomplished in the, the next year or two. So it's like a really multi-pronged approach, right? Just like Dree said, you're meeting people where they're at. Some people want to be homeowners. How do we tear down the barriers so that people can become homeowners? Some people want to just rent a safe, decent, affordable home. How do you create more capacity in that? Some people own a home and they can't keep up with the, the maintenance costs. And so how do you kind of offset those costs and make that available? So it's a really creative program. All right, so participants, I'm gonna ask Patrice one more question. And then we're going to open it up for you guys. So how do we start to, to get some of the questions in the queue or raise your hands? So one of the things I know, um, Patrice, is that there's been a real place-based emphasis started on the South Side. Mm -hmm. I know that this Healthy Neighborhood Healthy Families has started to adopt a new neighborhood, the Linden neighborhood. Could yeah. you just talk about the, the differences of working in two different neighborhoods and, and how, again, have you brought a racial equity lens to it because they're different kind of um, neighborhoods in terms of what they're bringing and, and how the, the uh, anchor approach has been operationalized there? Absolutely. Um, one of the phenomenal things about the work that we do is, is that we have clinics in every area of Columbus, right? And so in Linden, which is one of our new areas, is broken up into two sections. It's North Linden and South Linden. South Linden is predominantly African-American neighborhood, um, historically, and a very um, prideful neighborhood that loves their community. Um, North Linden is the same. I grew up in both of those areas, full disclosure. Um, so Part of the work has been partnering with the city of Columbus who did a, a phenomenal um, neighborhood planning effort and bringing that plan to life. 
And so with the work that we did on the South side, we had a lot of learnings from that work. One of those things was keeping the community at the table. And part of our South side work, um, we have different advisory groups, where it's either our good neighborhood agreement group, or we have a non-disclosure group that constantly informs the work that we do here at the hospital in the community. On, in the Linden area, it's the same thing. Uh, we're going into the spaces that they're in and keeping them connected to the work that we're doing, as well as letting them inform the work through our Linden Housing Advisory Group and our overall Linden Advisory Group. And so we're doing the same thing there where we're doing um, home ownership. Uh, we'll have our first two home ownerships um, available in November. Remember this year, really excited about that, um, as well as rental properties and home repair. Um, home repair is a little more expensive. Um, this is a red line area in the past, um, and a lot of the work um, has been surprisingly um, massive. So the average for those home repairs is hovering around $30,000 for a home. So um, a lot of the um, participants have been in a home on an average of 25 years and they're committed to the community. So it's been phenomenally uh, rewarding in helping them stay in their home. All right, awesome. Um, I am gonna open it up. I know Caroline put a great uh, 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 question in the chat, but I, I really do want people use either the chat feature, raising hands or other things if, if people wanna do it. One question that uh, Caroline had around was around the funding for these efforts. Um, and uh, I'd just be curious, Patrice, if you could speak to some of those funding, and then I may actually ask Wiley to weigh in as well on, on those. Absolutely. So Nationwide Children's Hospital has been um, a phenomenal partner and committed to this work. And so one of the things that I want to express to folks on this um, conference call is that the hospital doesn't have to fund a billion dollar project. They are guaranteeing money. So if there's $15 million being offered by the city or another organization, they're coming in and offering one and a half million dollars guaranteed, right? To help get the ball rolling and show their commitment, as well as some of the home repairs and some of the um, new construction work that we've done, they offer grants for this work, um, recognizing that there are gaps that need to be closed, that there are things that we cannot control, such as construction costs and labor costs, which is a real thing in 2022. Um, so uh, the hospital has really put their uh, money where their mouth is as far as making sure that um, folks be connected to affordable housing, as well as to the other programs that are part of the h and &H work. Yeah. So I'm just going to unpack that work, uh, that answer a little bit, just because I do think that um, uh, one of the things I know as a pediatrician is that it's taken me a little while to understand the finance terms. Mm -hmm. So as we think about this work, it's all about partnership and leverage, right? So how does a hospital help to make sure that an affordable housing deal is done? One of the things that can happen is, is that people don't want to invest in it because it's viewed as too risky. Mm -hmm. And so one way that hospitals can do it is that they can provide just a small amount of a guarantee to the project so that it de-risks it such that, that banks and city feel comfortable providing some of the loans because they feel more confident that the loans will get repaid. And so those are like, again, creative ways in which hospital systems can um, make sure that a project gets green lit instead of getting bogged down in paperwork and other things. And then sometimes it is grants, right? It is that you're providing grant, but the grant is going to be helping somebody stay in the community long term. And mm -hmm. so the return on that investment of, of somebody not being displaced out of that neighborhood that that's been home for them, Absolutely. that's worth kind of a, a community benefit dollar that can be reported uh, to the IRS, et cetera. And I want to add one more thing that I don't think it's often talked about is that the gravitas that a hospital institution offers in this space also helps bring in not just like government funding or private um, like organization funding, but philanthropy as well. And so the folks that you know that are already connected to the work in a different way, they see this work being done and they see how they fit into it and they trust the process a lot more because the hospital is fully supporting it. Yeah, I just want to plus one that this idea of being the institutional backer is what we talk a lot about at BMC, that by us showing up and being that institutional backer, even if it's not money, it's influence, political power, endorsement, connections. Again, that's about the inclusion that people don't always have. Um, 
Uh, Wiley, do you want to comment a little bit on where the funding for the anchor work uh, comes from UCSF? Yeah, Megan, thank you. Um, so I have to say a lot of times when we talk about anchor work, it is about transforming the way we do business at, at institutions like UCSF to make us more inclusive, particularly racially more inclusive. So with that, you know, I think you have to show some skin in the game, right? The institution has to show their commitment and I have to say our chancellor and his leadership has really showed their commitment the past couple of years by funding an infrastructure team, a team of five, six of us right now, full-time working on this, you know, cultivating the infrastructure for workforce, which is what Mike, Michael Jones is doing. We have Marlies doing that under the purchasing piece. Uh, Raquel and I are co-leading the, the, the um, community investment piece. So you need people power, dedicated people power to do that. Having said that, you know, to do work, you need programming resources too, right? So we have a mix of funding for that. So one of the, the initiatives that, that Michael Jones mentioned is the outside in. So we have a program called Excel, and that is collaboration with a community nonprofit called JVS. We work very closely with the Office of Economic Workforce Development as well as our, as our human services agency. So everybody chip in in terms of resources, people, power, uh, capacity to make that happen. So it is very much a joint effort. We're constantly looking for funding as well, not just, you know, because the more you do, the more you have to do. So constantly looking for that extra resources for sure. Megan, I, I just like to add that I think that organizations like UCSF is reaching out back into the community and they understand that there are some issues in the community. For example, if you are building a new building for your campus and it's you're building it in a unresourced community, what are the needs of that community? Do they need showers? Simple things like, you know, access to a just a shower. You can install those on the building when you when you create this new entity or this new building. So I mean just those little those small things are so valuable to the community and you know just you know, if there is a drug infested area that you're building your new building in um you know have a safe place for folks to you know do their thing but you know so those are creative ways that we can look at uh you know adding value to what we're trying to do when it comes to uh social uh equity yeah yeah, I definitely think um, what you're hearing a little bit is um, uh, to do this work for healthcare anchor, you need your own capacity internally, right? Like you need to have the ability to do it. And, and so institutions are putting their, their investment into that capacity. And then there also needs to be capacity building in community, right? Outside of the four walls to be able to be you know, to listen and be strategic. Um, I'll give an example of um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is driving more and more construction jobs to people of color and women in the community because those are good paying jobs oftentimes, right? Union jobs that, that have good, and yet we know they aren't necessarily um, always accessed. What we heard more and more from women was that childcare does not open at 6.30 in the morning, oftentimes when the, the construction job starts. And so we're actually using some philanthropy that we raised to now fund a childcare center that's going to be open off hours and start much earlier and end later. And that is kind of our catalyst to trying to be able to listen to community and provide that capacity so that those jobs can be able to do it. And, and just to, to Wiley's point, right? Like, UCSF is going to spend billions of dollars should they choose to use economic inclusion as a lens they can drive their dollars that they're going to spend anyway and people they're going to hire anyway to close the racial wealth gap to close the um, economic opportunity gaps and those are the types of opportunities that we want to constantly be looking for to try and um, advance racial equity. All right, I'm gonna open it up. Uh, I'm gonna continue to ask and invite the, the um, audience to the conversation. I, Caroline put a really good question in the chat. So I'll ask for like a go around around this of what have you learned each of you 
about how to earn the trust of community partners. Um, because there's a lot of power dynamics here. Um, maybe I'll start with Patrice and then we'll go to, to um, Mike and then uh, Doug, I know you have opinions and then Wiley. Um, I would say it's two things for us. Um, one, um, show up um, in spaces and places that already exist. You know, we have to be mindful of the fact that some of the people that are experiencing those racial equity dynamics, they are struggling just like the folks that they're trying to serve in the community, right? And so um, not taxing them with another meeting um, during their work time. Um, if they have a, a meeting scheduled, show up, share speak with them. Like, you know, that that is a great opportunity to do that. The other thing is, is that um, deliver on what you promise. Um, you know, early wins like home repair. You know, when people start seeing the work happen in the community, um, they gain a lot more respect for the institution that's doing the work versus um, one that says, yeah, we want to do this and then nothing ever happens. Um, so with Linden, especially, I'm a community that had heard a lot of promises over the years. Um, as soon as they saw the first house go up and the first home repair being done, they were all in. So um, deliver on what's been promised. Love that. Mike, what do you think? And then I'll go Doug, sorry. Absolutely. So I think uh, trust, earlier you asked, what's one of the challenges um, that we could face? And I think we could always go out and find new, new funders. We could always try to find new source of revenues. Um, but you can't really repair trust once it's broken. And I think the, the first step for us is having a shared language. And I'll give a very quick example. So some of the work that, um, that we all might do when we go out and engage with our broader community, we may say, hey, we need to hit our ROI, which is hiring more people. And to a nonprofit, that may translate as, I need to send you more people. And so, but sending me people in what fashion, right? Do we have a clear line of communication that we are sharing exactly what we're looking for? You understand what we're looking for because the volume that they may send may not translate to the hires that we're looking for. And therefore, now you end up with no hires and that trust begins to dwindle because now there isn't an understanding of what you're truly looking for and what you want to actually get accomplished. And so I think the first step of trust for us is always being mindful that we may have unshared language that we need to work on. And on also understanding what motivates our partners. You know, it's not just for our institutions to come in and be able to do some really great things and then say, pat our back on selves on the back and say, look what we did. You know, if we really are creating long-term success and wealth building in the community, it's empowering, or not rather empowering, but really delivering the tools that we have at our disposal to our partners and saying, this is how we need to, this is how you could get more. This is how you could partner with others across the city. Um, because if we're just diving in, fixing something that we think we're fixing and moving out, the problem really didn't get fixed. It's just kind of a Band-Aid uh, effect where we just patched it for that moment. Um, and that could create a rod in of trust if we're not careful of how we do that and really build strategic partnerships that benefit everyone involved and not just the, the entities that look to gain from it. You know, I thanks Mike for that comment and also Patrice. I Patrice, your a point is just so right on on target. I was just thinking like you gotta have some wins and you have to uh, promote those wins, right? Even if it's a simple thing as a you know, I give you an example. UCSF has a, a catering um, uh, business that they are trying to have more diverse small businesses participate uh, as a vendor for uh, the campus. And so one of the wins that occurred recently was that we had a significant amount of food vendors that came on board to participate, to have a diverse um, variety of different foods from different different ethnicities. So that was a huge win and people, you know, in terms of gaining trust, you definitely got to have um, proof in the pudding and you got to walk the walk and it's so important because you know we as the community we have been sold this huge um you know uh, dream of, of participating on these contracts and, and getting jobs and 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 having access to different things but those don't come to fruition and when they don't come to fruition it's just it's really heavy lifting it makes it more difficult for us as advocates for the community 
to be engaged because they're going to be very, um, you know, I don't want to hear that. You know, you guys promised X, Y, and Z. It didn't happen. Don't come to me with that again. You know, and that is the challenge. And that it, it that basically trickles down to other folks in the community. And so we just have to, you know, um, do what we say we're going to do. And I think that's the the crux of the matter. The advantage of speaking last is that all the great stuff already said. So um, completely agree with everybody. But what I would add is is this sort of um, issue of how institution like us interface with the community because we're often accused of being transactional, very short term minded. Uh, whereas what I've learned from our mentors uh, from the community are that we want relationship with institutions like UCSF not just in good times when you have funding to be, do things, but in bad times as well. So the committees and steering committee that I talked about was started 15 plus years ago. So we've had that very long-term relationship. So it was not that hard for us to bring people to the table because they know that we were trying, that we're trying to do, we're try, we care deeply and we're trying to make a difference. And just grateful that Doug is there at the table. It's been what, two, three years, Doug? And prior to that, you've been very active with the UC system-wide issues around diverse spend. So just really appreciating people like Doug's time, you know, you know, hoping that he 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 thinks that we're trying our best and trying to make a difference. Absolutely. I I, I totally do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be be here today. And and one other thing is like it's it's like it's philanthropic, right? For me and my peers, because it's you know, you're you're not giving money, but you're giving knowledge. You're giving um you know, updates to the community. Hey, there's an RFP coming out that's right in your wheelhouse. Come on, man, bid on it. You know, yeah. let's get to the table. So otherwise they wouldn't know about it. And so it, it's really, really a neat opportunity to be a part of the Anchor Institute. And I really enjoy this work. I think it's definitely rewarding when I could see someone that was struggling making X amount of revenue that is going up in terms of their revenue because of the participation that they've seen at, at UCSF. And um, so, so it's really a really great um, opportunity to see growth for folks. Yeah. No, 100%. I'm really appreciative of, of all of those answers. I feel like um, the themes of kind of tangible action being really important, being able to do that. I hear that a lot from um, it. I just want to give some shout out to the chat. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Manon and, and Wanda and um, uh, for contributing because I totally agree with a, a lot of what is being said around the um, issues related to kind of community needs to lead. So we often will talk about institutions need to change, not people is one of our principles. Um, uh, community needs to lead and then um, partnership works at the speed of trust. And so you have to focus on the trust building and, and other actions. Um, I'm also gonna give some shout outs to the, the chat. There's some really good resources that were put in there. If people didn't see them, Patrice shared a toolkit that they recently worked on called From Silos to Collaborations, Building a Health Partner Investment Strategy. Caroline put in a bunch of different ones from the Build Healthy Places, the Healthcare Anchor Network, which um, both Boston Medical Center and UCSF are part of, that is a really great um, source. And then the Center for Community Investment that both Nationwide Children's and BMC has been a part of. I want to give a shout out there. And then really, we um, we're really uh, pleased to do this presentation. This is going to be recorded, but give us feedback on how we did. And so please, um, uh, Caroline, put that in uh, to let us know how the, the session went for you and how we could improve it for, for future sessions. So um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and end on time. So we're going to give a round of applause to our amazing uh, set of speakers and just thank you guys for this really thoughtful uh, conversation. I learned a ton. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.